Today is the day that our Savior has died. The day that we see Him laid in the tomb. The tomb that was close by, so they laid Him there. We celebrate Good Friday. Good Friday. Why is everything black then? Everything's black, everything's bare. It's a connotation of death. We have a bare altar, we have bare walls. It's a bare worship space. Usually there's ornamentation, there's flowers, there's liturgical paraphernalia up here. But all it is is devoid of anything. It's like a day devoid of hope. How can we have hope when we've lost our leader, our Messiah has died? Is this really what was supposed to happen? Really think about how the disciples must have felt at this time. In John's Gospel, we only see one at the cross, the disciple whom Jesus loved, which we assume is John. They must have completely lost all hope, right? They had given up three years of their lives to follow this man. They left everything, their jobs, their families, their villages, their lives, Everything they left behind to follow Jesus and to learn from Him and to do what He tried to teach them to do. And now their teacher has been crucified for high treason against the Roman Empire. There's no hope. can no longer continue the path they've followed for the past three years, and at least in their minds they can't go back home. Can you imagine the ridicule that they would have to face? That they would receive from their family members, from their friends? Their lives might as well be over too. There's no hope. Jesus is dead. Where do we go? What do we do? But can any of us empathize with the disciples? Have you ever been in a situation in your life that has left you feeling totally helpless? Like there's no chance of life continuing. This is the end of it. There's no hope after this. I'm going to give a few situations. Have you ever not been able to have a child? It's been proven medically that fertility is not there. There's not going to be any children at all. And you really want to have children. Then a miracle of miracles happens and you finally become pregnant. And after a couple months there's complication and the baby is no longer living. So there has to be a DNC. The miracle that you thought was there had to end in no hope. A child that was to be never will be. Or what if you wake up in the morning to go to the crib to get your six-month-old daughter... And there's no movement, and when you look closer, you see that there's no breath. She's dead. There's no hope. How do you go on from that? Or what if there's a phone call late at night to your house? It's the state police. There's been an automobile accident, and your 16-year-old son has been killed. Where's the hope? Where's the love of God that usually rains down on us? What if you're going to see a doctor because of a second miscarriage in less than a year and there's nothing medically wrong? There's nothing that should be causing it. Where's the family that you so long for and how can you possibly continue in a life that seems hopeless? Where do we turn when our Savior is behind a rock wrapped in linens? Dead. How can our Savior, how can our Messiah help us now? But before you think it's so dark, there is hope, even in the hopelessness of this day. There at the end of our reading, Joseph of Arimathea was a secret disciple of Jesus. He was one of the ones possibly listed in John 12. Nevertheless, many, even of those authorities, believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it. 
lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. He could have been someone who followed the teaching of Jesus for some time and secretly held to it, secretly held that everything Jesus was saying to be truth, without wanting to jeopardize his place in the synagogue. But at the death of Jesus, Joseph lays everything on the line. And in the hopelessness of Jesus' death, he comes forward to request the body of Jesus be removed from the cross and allowed to be buried. Usually the Romans would leave the bodies of those being crucified up on the crosses for vultures and other birds of prey and as an example for those who would walk by not to push their luck and to stay within the bonds of the law so the Romans would keep everybody in line. But Joseph puts everything on the line to make sure Jesus' body is given the respect it reserves as a teacher of the truth as the one who claimed to be the Messiah. And there is another name in our reading here at the end that comes at the end that mixes darkness and light, hopelessness and the bountifulness of the hope that is in Jesus. And that is Nicodemus. Nicodemus is the Pharisee who first comes to Jesus under the cover of darkness in John chapter 3. And we all know that story of Jesus, of Jesus and Nicodemus where Nicodemus comes questioning him on how can a person be born again? Can a person enter a second time into their mother's womb? Nicodemus just did not get it then, but over time probably grew grew in his discipleship, in his faith, in his understanding of who Jesus was, because over time he was probably one of those that was listed also in John chapter 12 as a secret disciple of Jesus. Because you see in John chapter 7, verses 45 through 52, where the Jewish leaders and the Pharisees want to arrest Jesus, Nicodemus stands up for Jesus. Albeit a lukewarm stand-up, he's making a public statement about Jesus. And here in our text, he's coming out with Joseph shedding the shroud which they follow Jesus under. Now opening the door and walking out into the light, now in what seems like the darkest part of Jesus' existence, Nicodemus and Joseph step into the light to prepare Jesus' body for burial. The darkness has been overcome by the light and the fear of the Jews no longer has any effect on Nicodemus or Joseph. They are the hope in this hopeless time. They are the believers that are not on the radar on our radar screens or the radar screens of the Romans. They're the ones who come to our aid when things in our lives seem out of place and it seems like the world is shutting in on us and everybody else is against us. They are the ones who bring the hope and the love of the one who seems like he is so far away from us in our dark, hopeless corners of our lives. They are the living love that Jesus portrayed to all of his followers. They are Jesus living to everyone who rejected him and everyone who rejects us. Even in the darkest point of Jesus' existence, when the eleven disciples are nowhere to be found, there are disciples, and there is still love, and faith, and hope. As Paul tells the Thessalonians, so that you may not grieve as others do have who have no hope. So that you may not grieve as others who have no hope. Know that there is still hope. Even in the darkest time of Jesus' existence, there is always hope. There's a light that comes through the disciples who came out of hiding to proclaim their belief in the teachings of a man who is the Messiah and who is the Savior of the world. So they laid Jesus in the tomb. And the message of his faith, hope, and love continued in the faces of these unknown disciples those hidden from the public before, but who now lay open claim to the faith, hope, and love abiding, the same faith, hope, and love given to us by our Savior. So come out of the darkness and claim the hope that is there, and no matter what, will never leave. Amen.